I am Mary Lloyd Ireland, orthopedic surgeon, University of Kentucky. This presentation is on injuries in the skeletally immature throwing athlete. We're seeing more and more injuries to young baseball pitchers, and this will give you an idea of the type of injuries that we're seeing on a case-based approach. We'll go through an introduction, talk about medial elbow pain, present medial epicondyle fractures, present stress fractures of the olecranon, conditions that aren't what they seem, unusual conditions of a shoulder tumor, and then talk about conclusions and where we go from here. The participation in numbers in organized sports continues to increase. In 2003, it was estimated that 30 million adolescents and pre-adolescents participate in or organized sports. Hence, we see a lot more overuse injuries from the practices and the repetitive movements that these children do. Looking at little leaguers, it was estimated in 2007 by Little League Organization that there were two, over 2 million baseball participants almost 370,000 softball participants, and 2.6 million total Little League participants. USA Baseball estimates that there are 9 million participants aged 9 to 17. Lots of skeletally immature individuals, or almost mature, who unfortunately are having too many overuse injuries involving the elbow and the shoulder. I would encourage you to visit these dot coms for updated information uh, and things that you as a practitioner, healthcare provider can do to prevent these injuries by prevention programs, pitch counts, etc. In a survey of age 7 to 13 year old children playing two seasons, community organized, the injury rates per thousand athletic exposures in this study of Radelet and Leppart and Rubenstein Myers Pediatrics 2002 showed that soccer was 2.1, the leader, baseball 1.7, football 1.5, and softball one injury rate per thousand athlete exposures. So this is their practices, games, uh, and you would really think that football might be the number one injury rate, but soccer was number one, followed by baseball. So we see all too many injury rates in these sports that are more overused sports that you wouldn't think there would be that many numbers of injuries. We do need more information, injury registries, and in children, skeletally immature, because we don't have a lot of information on the actual diagnoses and numbers of injuries, whether they're overuse or traumatic injuries. What do we see in the skeletally mature? The path of least resistance is the growth plate. So in this uh, upper series of the distal radius, this is a gymnast who is doing a repetitive axial loading. And what happens is the radius Epiphyseal plate closes, so there is relative overgrowth of the ulna because there is a fusion of the distal radius. We see this when young, immature individuals are doing weight-bearing activities on their upper extremities, a preventable injury if they don't do too much on their skeletally mature wrists. The lower picture is Little Leaguer's shoulder, the one on of the right shoulder, which is on your left, shows epiphyseal lucency, and you can see on this striker view the difference on the right of the right shoulder compared to the left shoulder, where there is widening of the epiphysis, indicating a Salter Harris type 1 fracture of the proximal humerus. This is Little Leaguer's shoulder. There is a potential for bony adaptation here, and this is one of the reasons why we see increased external rotation in the young pitcher and an arc of motion, which should be the same, uh, but there be reduced internal rotation compared to the opposite side. 
So this is felt to be a rotational adaptation that occurs where it's almost like having a slipped capital femoral epiphysis of the proximal humerus instead of the femur. So this is a little leaguer shoulder, a bony Salter Harris fracture. Goes ahead and heals. Typically these individuals have a season that where it will bother them. If you do get an x-ray, it's good to back them down for that season. It takes about six, eight weeks for the fracture to actually heal, but you've got to understand that they're in a growth phase at that point and there are reasons why this occurred and it's because they're throwing too much, too hard, and never stopping. Little Leaguer Shoulder in Carson and Gasser's uh, series from 1998. They had 23 patients that had a proximal humeral epiphyseal fracture. Their ages were 14 years. 19 of these 23 were pitchers. They had pain while throwing. Again, it was diffuse pain. The average duration of symptoms was 7.7 .7 months. So they had this for quite some time before the diagnosis was made. The treatment rest for an average of three months, follow-up average of 9.6 months, and 91% return to baseball. So this isn't a bad thing to have, but it is important to diagnose it, and hopefully we can increase the awareness by understanding to get an x-ray and not have them wait 7.7 .7 months before it's diagnosed. Fiseal and range of motion changes. This is 79 youth pitchers in a study by Dr. Mayer, Ohl, Robbie, Brindle from the University of Kentucky. Increased fiseal width on the dominant side, and there's increased external rotation on the dominant side in these little leaguers' elbows, pa elbow patients, indicating this bony adaptation of external rotation of the epiphysis on the metaphysis and subsequent greater external rotation on the dominant side and less internal rotation. Not a capsular or rotator cuff GERD problem, but more of a bony adaptation. When we look at the elbow, the forces laterally are compression forces, the forces medially are tensile forces. So if you think about throwing a baseball, what happens is the ulnar collateral ligament pulls on the medial side. The UCL actually attaches in the axilla more lateral to the medial humeral epicondyle. And laterally we see problems with osteochondritis to seconds of the capitellum because of these compressive forces where the radial head is harder than the capitellum. So we see breakdown of the capitellum and potential loose bodies that can be removed arthroscopically, but the main key is to diagnose problems early by staying uh, in touch with coaches, parents, and if little leaguers have elbow pain or loss of motion, then they should probably be checked out and have x-rays done. Again, medially are tensile forces, laterally are compression forces. The more devastating injury is an ulnar collateral ligament sprain or tear in a skeletally immature individual. We see much more uh, commonly little leaguer's elbow, which is a medial humeral epicondyle fracture, different from a UCL injury. This is an individual who came into our clinic, right-hand dominant pitcher. He had to quit pitching a couple of years ago. He never really told his parents that his elbow was hurting. In that view on the lower right, you can see a prominence of his radial head, and it looks like he has a little indentation there in his capitellum. He hadn't had an injection or anything, but this is a uh, arthritic elbow in an 18-year-old. Not only can he not throw, he can't do manual labor and do some of the uh, work activities he wanted to do for a career. He had range of motion of um, 30 to 110 compared with 0 and 140 on the opposite side. Loss of supination and pronation pretty significantly one side compared to the other, as you can see in the upper left. His x-rays showed severe osteoarthritis. He had radial head overgrowth and probably had an old osteochondritis to seconds of his capitellum. The capitellum kind of disappears and the radial head overgrows, and you can see the significant osteophytes 
on the lateral, S, uh, lateral view on the right a potentially prevent, prevention problem uh, that if we picked this up early, uh, he would not have had this arthritic elbow that really there's no good treatment for. What are the risk factors? Why do these individuals have a ulnar collateral ligament injury, have shoulder and elbow injuries? The risk factors are overuse, fatigue, high pitch velocity, showcase participation. In this study done by Olson, Fleissig, Dunn, and Andrews in risk factors for shoulder and elbow injuries in adolescent pitchers, showcase was uh, a very high um, reason for having significant injuries. This series had 95 pitchers who needed surgery, 45 adolescents had no surgery. Doing the multivariant analysis, injury risk and in pitching, fivefold that they got injured, shoulder or elbow, if they threw and pitched eight months out of the year or greater, fourfold if they pitched greater than 80 pitches, 2.6 fold if they pitched faster, greater than 85 miles an hour, and 36 times greater if they had arm fatigue, which is a self reported arm fatigue. Most pitchers say they have arm fatigue and they continue to pitch. Dr. Andrews is quoted as saying the speed gun is the worst invention in the history of Little League Baseball. The young pitchers want to throw faster, impress their peers, coaches, and parents, so they will do anything and they don't understand what pain means. The risk of serious injury for youth baseball pitchers in a 10-year prospective study done by Fleissig and Andrews, published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2011. There were 481 youth pitchers, ages 9 to 14. They had annual reviews, surgery history. This was a cumulative incidence of injury that was 5%. And again, the risk factors were greater than 100 innings per year making them 3.5 times more likely to be injured. Pitchers who play catcher tended to get injured more frequently, unable to demonstrate any effect on play. The suggestions from this study were that curveballs thrown earlier than age 13 were not good, and pitchers should not play the position of catcher. Little league pitchers do not become big league pitchers. This is something to talk to your little league coaches, parents, and even the children about. So it's better to play a, another position and not be a pitcher. The ones that are the very um, high velocity pitchers, usually the ones that get hurt, the ones who I can say this because I am a girl. They throw like a girl. They don't really generate enough velocity to be injured in their shoulder or their elbow. Upper extremity injuries in the adolescent um, athlete. Review of what we see and know. Uh, more likely to be injured are multiple sports, year-round competition and training. Assess earlier, rest more, and plan the year. Think of periodization, planning, taking some time off, and this was a uh, review from Mara Scala in uh, sports medicine and arthroscopy. These are the recommendations for reducing injury risk in a thrower. The STOP program, if you go to this.org, Stop Sports Injuries, this is a sports injury campaign that reaches out to youth sports in the community, public service announcements, these uh, sports injury websites, podcasts, and a national media campaign. And this is where I think we can really bring the individual athletes into our program by having them visit this website. Uh, it's a fun website to visit, and maybe the children will make their parents bring them in to be seen if they have some of the symptoms. They're different sports. Baseball is one of them. This is the 12 line on online brochure, 12 page online brochure on sports trauma and overuse prevention, keeping kids in the game for life. So this is what STOP stands for. 
It's endorsed by several different um, uh, associations. When we look at medial elbow pain as far as a diagnosis in thrower, what do we see? The younger individuals will have a medial epicondyle stress fracture as we go from skeletally immature to mature in throwers in males age 14 to 15. They get into an increased risk of an ulnar collateral ligament tear. Also, you can have associated with the above ulnar neuritis or hypermobility or ulnar neuropathy. Flexor pronator strain is much less common. I try to make this diagnosis based on manual muscle testing. They will hurt more in flexing and pronating the forearm, flexing the uh, elbow and pronating the forearm, um, hurt over the muscle mass, and not hurt as much with tensile or distraction testings, which would be more of a ligament injury. They can also have a subluxating medial triceps, much less common. Valgus extension overload can be associated with a UCL injury, it's elbow impingement. They have a positive bounce home test when you try to bring them into extension. There also are sublime tubercle fractures of the proximal ulna at the site of UCL attachment. If these are diagnosed early, immobilized, they can heal, but this is of concern uh, in the proximal ulna, diagnosed best by plain films, assessment of that, and usually an MRI scan. UCL injury tears in youth pitchers. The incidence is rising. The diagnosis needs to be made early. Plain x-rays can determine if there is a medial humeral epicondyle stress fracture. The ulnar collateral ligament instability tests are the static ones that we've done for many years, valgus stress testing at 30 degrees of flexion. The ones that I find um, most helpful for me is O'Driscoll's um, moving valgus stress test that reproduces the symptoms. It is um, okay to do in uh, skeletally immature. And then there's also O'Brien's milking maneuver, but basically reproducing those tensile or distraction forces of the UCL medially. The moving valgus stress test is shown here. So the shoulder is abducted to 90 degrees, elbow is maximally flexed. You are supplying a valgus torque and then extension of the elbow is done from 120 out to 70 degrees and the patient will usually say yes that's what happens when my elbow hurts so you're reproducing the mechanism of injury and diagnosing clinically a UCL sprain doesn't tell you if it's torn completely or not So it reproduces the stresses of the throw, late cocking, early acceleration, and the pain occurs at the point of maximum stress, confirmed by the history. So it's from 70 to 120 typically is where you will reproduce um, medial pain with this moving valgus stress test. Now I'll talk about a couple of cases. A 12-year-old boy, a little league pitcher, he was having a pain in the medial aspect of his elbow five months prior. He felt a pop in his elbow. He didn't really seek medical attention. He sat out the rest of the season, played football. He didn't have any problems. He had been in a rapid growth phase. Medial elbow pain started when he started pitching again. So this is kind of a classic history. They quit pitching. They feel better. They think they're okay. So he started pitching again. He'd had some elbow soreness five months prior. These are patient's initial elbow x-rays. So he had the um, soreness five months ago and he comes in with a new onset of elbow pain. His medial epicondyle is still open. You can see this little minimally displaced avulsion at the inferior aspect of the medial epicondyle. Remember the ulnar collateral ligament, the majority of it, including the anterior band, attaches into the axilla of the medial condyle not actually on the medial epicondyle. The flexor pronator mass originates on the medial epicondyle. So you can see um, his injured side on the left hand side of the screen and his comparison view is on the right. So his left elbow, the epicondyle is a little smaller and you don't see that avulsion. So the question is does he have a partial injury of his ulnar collateral ligament complete injury of the ulnar collateral ligament or is there an avulsion of the medial epicondyle 
and his UCL may be okay. This is this little minimally displaced avulsion inferior, pole, the inferior aspect of the medial epicondyle, and it probably came from the epicondyle and not from the condyle down below where the UCL attaches. These were his initial films up on the top, comparison views down below. So you can see a definite uh, difference with a little widening of the lower portion of the medial epicondyle growth plate and also uh, that uh, minimally displaced avulsion. Uh, and if we get an oblique view on the right, it almost looks like it's not as displaced as the one in the middle. We don't really see any, uh, anything on the lateral view. The olecranon apophysis is still open. So we um, kept him from throwing out that the rest of the season. Follow up at two weeks in the upper left. Six weeks. You can see where that fracture is actually healing. So we caught it at an acute time, backed him down from throwing, reduced those tensile forces tugging on the medial epicondyle, and this goes on to heal. At four weeks, lower left, four months, middle, um, lower row, in 19 months you can see where he is skeletally mature now and completely healed. So at 19 month follow-up he's now in the eighth grade, he's 14 and a half, he's 6'3", 217 pounds, a big lanky, very large individual who does have some core weakness Scapula's um, uh, not um, too muscular about it, no stabilizing um, uh, muscles around the scapula. But fortunately, his um, medial epicondyle avulsion did heal, and he had a stable ulnar collateral ligament. So you can think of this fracture as being a like a BB, uh, a little bullet appearance to the medial epicondyle. So, and it may heal if you diagnose it early and you don't allow them to keep on pitching. This could turn into a UCL injury and an avulsion with the proximity of the uh, UCL attachment. But fortunately, in his case, this was more of a bony injury and his ulnar collateral ligament was intact. This is a 14-year-old pitcher who was not as lucky as that individual that we treated aggressively with reducing his pitching. We didn't have to catch it, uh, cast him, but we stopped him from pitching and reduced him from those tensile stresses on the medial aspect of his elbow. And this 14-year-old kept on throwing and throwing. You see how he had a similar little injury to that BB that uh, we described, um, but on this stress view radiographs, you can see how much he opened. So he has a complete ulnar collateral ligament tear and required uh, ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction in a still skeletally immature individual. Pretty sad situation and something that we could have prevented from happening if he came in early and we made the diagnosis. So the moral to these cases is you know, if you got your BB gun, don't allow them to fire too soon. Make the diagnosis and protect these children from hurting themselves. So in that 14-year-old with a UCL injury, is this a case of child abuse? It's a form of child abuse. Uh, I think this could be prevented. So his baseball career was ended. UCL reconstruction was performed. So we need to do better with making parents, coaches aware that children will be children. They don't feel pain. They'll keep throwing at all costs, and they don't uh, really understand what the nature of elbow or shoulder injuries are. It's up to us to diagnose things early and implement appropriate treatment. Oftentimes, it's just backing them down from the sport for a while. In the elbow, anatomically, the sublime tubercle is where the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament attaches. This is the, uh, the view from Salvo's article, which described the anatomy and some of these fractures. 
This can be difficult to see on plain x-rays and sometimes MRI scan is necessary. This is again from this article. You can see the sublime tubercle fracture on the plain films. This went on to a non-union after non-operative treatment. You can see the MRI scan. UCL looks to be intact, but there is this synovial fluid in the non-union, as you can see in the uh, MRI scan in the lower right. This required surgical fixation. Moving on to um, operative fixation of medial humeral epicondyle fractures and non-union in children. The medial epicondyle in children certainly can be fractured. There are ways that it gets fractured. It can be an avulsed, uh, displaced fracture and an elbow dislocation. It's always important to get a post-op x-ray and a fracture dislocation of the elbow because sometimes that medial epicondyle piece is displaced and you can't see it on the um, dislocated x-ray. So always get an x-ray after you do a reduction. There are a few series in the literature about the medial epicondyle. This is a series of non-unions in children. Eight patients underwent open reduction internal fixation. 11.3 years was the average age. Presentation was pain when they were lifting, valgus instability, limited range of motion. Some of them had ulnar nerve compression. They had significant improvement when they underwent open reduction internal fixation. And in the experience of Smith, they suggested fixing these medial epicondyle fractures early, particularly if they're displaced. And the ulnar collateral ligament is usually not torn. As we were talking about in the previous slides, the ulnar collateral ligament doesn't connect directly to the medial epicondyle. So throwers are in a little different situation than perhaps other athletes. If it's their non-dominant side, they may do okay and it may heal. But these can heal in a mal-rotated um, position because the flexor pronator is originating there. So sometimes they are more distal and rotated and may not heal as precisely as is needed for sports such as uh, overhead throwing and pitching. More series like this need to be done. So the concerns of non-operative treatment with these medial epicondyle fractures, obviously this is a displaced medial epicondyle fracture, but there is a high rate of non-union instability. Heavy laborers have weakness. Throwing athletes have uh, difficulty and are unable to throw like we talked about. So this is a, an acute medial epicondyle fracture. This individual was treated uh, non-operatively. This was minimally displaced, so he went ahead and healed. Oftentimes in our youth, baseball athletes are also football quarterbacks, so they never quit throwing. And sometimes this can occur with a football uh, throw or they're playing softball with their parents. So the controversy is how displaced is displaced. Um, do we have more of a six millimeter displacement on this one and it won't heal? and that might be the one that we fix. There's no clear, excellent def definition or prospective studies in the literature to tell us which ones to fix. Some of it can be the dominance, the way that they got hurt, the amount of displacement in the individual child. What constitutes a displaced uh, fracture? This is an individual who came in, baseball pitcher, football quarterback got hurt when he was uh, throwing a football. We thought he would heal without surgical management. Again, it looks like there is some displacement, several millimeters. It doesn't really look rotated, but we can be fooled on this, and sometimes other imaging studies may need to be done. An MRI scan would better delineate the UCL. CT scan would better deline delineate the exact uh, rotation of the fracture. But in this um, very skeletally immature individual, he will do fine with uh, immobilization uh, and not throwing. Got to back him down from throwing.
you can see the difference, the right side versus the left. Oftentimes this medial epicondyle in these uh, children who have been throwers um, will get bigger because probably of growth, growth um, and increased blood supply to that area. So there will usually be a asymmetry of the medial epicondyle. So this is this individual's uh, initial view, throwing football and baseball. He said he'd been having medial elbow pain for a couple of months. Initial view, he quit throwing at our suggestion and showing this to his parents. They understood that he indeed had a fracture that needed to have relative rest, didn't have to immobilize him, which kept him from throwing and backed him down from athletics. At one month, you can see the amount of healing that's occurred and then at three months it's healed. So to assess why he had this, it was probably obviously his age, but he had um, mechanics that he was throwing too hard for his medial epicondyle. So you gotta assess the strength and his throwing uh, style and allow him to get back to throwing activities the following season, not too fast. Granted the Medial epicondyle is healed, but you also have to assess his mechanics, his maturity, before you let him go back and pitch. This is a 16-year-old male who was throwing baseball in his backyard. Here's his involved side. You can see where on the lower left-hand slides does look like this is rotated and he's more skeletally mature than the other individual. He felt a pop in his elbow. He had had knee surgery where he had an osteochondritis to suck hands um, lesion fixed two months prior and he was not cleared to be throwing but it was his left knee and this is his dominant right elbow that he hurt. So probably some uh, not the best way to be throwing since he really didn't have a base to throw from uh, and this is what happened to him. Not involved on the opposite side. So this was rotated and displaced. It was of concern that perhaps we should fix it. He ended up having non-operative treatment and healed this. This was two weeks later, six weeks later, and four months later. This could be a bit rotated. He had some other issues, and although we had just done surgery on his knee, he had had some intra-op cardiac arrhythmias, and by the time pediatric cardiology saw him, it was six weeks, and the fragment had already been healing, and he was not yet cleared for surgery. So. He ended up healing this fracture, and I think we should see, look at more of these fracture patterns and understand them better to decide whether or not to operate on these medial epicondyle fractures. Certainly in a dominant thrower, pitcher, they um, do require watching closely, perhaps getting a CT scan, MRI scan to look at the rotation um, of this, this fracture fragment and fix some of them. It's easier to fix them anatomically acutely and see if they become a non-union and that can be a career ending problem for these individuals. Here was his MRI scan when uh, I did want to operate on him. If you look at the ulnar collateral ligament in the upper left hand slide it does look like that it's attached to that fragment and the fragment did look to be rotated. Um, Next case is a 17-year-old female right-hand dominant catcher. She dived back into base and sustained an elbow dislocation. She had immediate swelling and pain. So she is a soccer athlete, but also a catcher in softball, wants to continue to do both sports. She was located at the time she was examined by the athletic trainer. On physical exam, initially she had ecchymosis Range of motion was very limited, 45 to 110, pain over medial epicondyle, and she did open on valgus stress testing, no lateral pain, ulnar nerve function was normal, as was vascular status. 
So these are her x-rays. Um, the injured right elbow up above, you can see this fragment is a little smaller, but it looks even more rotated and displaced distally than the last one. Her other elbow, so she's uh, skeletally mature, but has pulled off her medial epicondyle. Throwing dominant side. Some other views of the right elbow in a blight view. It does look a bit more displaced. There was some controversy whether or not she should be operated on. Had a dislocated elbow. Typically, we treat that non-operatively and regain range of motion. The concern was that she was a thrower, and if we could put this back, since it looked like by her imaging studies the, MR, the uh, ulnar collateral ligament was attached to this, we elected to proceed with internal fixation. Here are her uh, MRI scan, stir coronals. The views on the upper uh, row do show the fragment that's rotated and the UCL that is attached to that fragment. Here's her examiner anesthesia. This is her uh, active range of motion. You can see the ecchymosis medially. We tried to get her a little better extension, so she had maybe 120 degrees of flexion, maybe about 40 of extension. Again, neurovascular status was, uh, was intact. Here was her exam pre-op, and now here's her exam under anesthesia. See the ecchymosis. Ulnar nerve was um, without hypermobility or injury. It was um, obviously sitting there. And um, we didn't do any transposition or exploration of the ulnar nerve. This is her medial approach to her elbow, her flexor pronator mass, ulnar nerve in the back. You can see the ecchymosis and hematoma from the fracture. We did a flexor pronator split to expose the uh, fracture. We felt in planning this that the fracture fragments were going to be too small to use any metal fixation directly through them, so we planned to use a shoulder anchor into the medial epicondyle cancellous bone and place this through the fragments with uh, drill holes. So here are the two fragments. The distal one was a little bit bigger. She did have evidence of a dislocation with uh, capsular injury anterior to these small fragments. So when we look again anatomically, the anterior band, most important portion of the ulnar collateral ligament, attaches into the axilla deep and lateral to the medial epicondyle. Then you have the flexor pronator originating off the medial epicondyle. So our surgery was to do a medial epicondyle repair and also incorporate the ulnar collateral ligament into that proximally with the suture anchor. This shows the anterior band, posterior band, and transverse band of the ulnar collateral ligament. And these were our surgical findings. She did, still did have a piece of the ulnar collateral ligament attached into that axilla, that fracture area. So we put the bone back down and that, in essence, will get the ulnar collateral ligament to uh, heal in a better position and we'll get that bony union without it being uh, displaced and rotated. This is a view of our anchor that we put in there and the sutures that we put through drill holes in the bony fragments. Repaired the capsule. Ulnar collateral ligament in the back. We left back there. We didn't do a transposition. And then this is our closure of the flexor pronator split. So the anchor that we used was a shoulder anchor going into the cancellous bone and used uh, drill holes through the bony pieces and the more distal one that I have in the forceps right now did have 
the ulnar collateral ligament attached that we're uh, pulling on right now, and we repaired it side to side as well. So that's the ulnar collateral ligament as it attaches into that um, axilla area deep and lateral to the medial epicondyle, and we repaired the capsular rent. Ulnar collateral ligament was, ulnar nerve was not dissected. So this is what our fixation is. So we get bony union and repair side to side the ulnar collateral ligament. Ulnar collateral ligament was uh, partially attached to that piece inferiorly. This is a 31-year-old laborer who had a medial epicondyle fracture at age 15. He underwent open reduction internal fixation. He was told it was healed, and he didn't really have any problems for a long time. Uh, he was swinging a hammer, and he felt a pop in his elbow. So these are his x-rays. We did get the x-rays when he was age 15, and this is when he's 31. He really had a non-union, and his medial epicondyle never healed. So he's right-handed. He underwent excision of the medial epicondyle nonunion, ulnar nerve transposition, repair of the flexor pronator mass, and his ulnar collateral ligament was actually stable, so it uh, had healed back, um, and he was having more issues with that bony nonunion, not with instability. This is his operative picture. The um, Alice uh, is on the unstable, displaced nonunion of the medial epicondyle, and you can see the ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, is marked deep, and that's the attachment where it is, again, into that axilla or lateral to the medial epicondyle um, and not directly on the medial epicondyle. Ulnar nerve is seen with the vessel loop anteriorly. He ended up doing fine postoperatively. So here he is with his non-union. Here he is with this removing the piece and doing an ulnar nerve transposition. Olecranon stress fractures do occur. This is again a thrower's uh, injury in this uh, series by Charlton. Five baseball players, persistent, persistent olecranon physis stayed open. They underwent open reduction internal fixation with bone graft. The mechanism is the uh, extension forces, eccentric forces on the triceps. We see it in gymnasts, divers, baseball athletes. It can also be combined with valgus extension overload and overhead throwing athletes. This is a 14-year-old baseball res athlete, wrestler, football player. He did have hyperextension injuries, uh, impingement of lateral synovial band, but he had an olecranon stress fracture as well. So this is his initial presentation. You can see on that lateral view on the right where there is um, a gap uh, in the olecranon apophysis. It really does look like it's apophyseal, but it goes toward the uh, joint, indicating there probably is some synovial fluid that's into that apophysis. Six months after his initial symptoms, he had continued elbow pain. You can see now where there's more radiolucency, more um, of a uh, depth there, and the part toward the joint definitely has a separation. So he has a non-union. Treatment for this is open reduction internal fixation. The triceps attaches here, so you don't want to excise this piece. That would be a disaster. Here he is at two weeks post-op at four weeks post-op and three months post-op. You can see where once we uh, give compression over this fracture, it heals very quickly. He returned to full throwing activities without uh, problems at six months post-op. This is a 15-year-old pitcher with a painful elbow can see the white appearance to the olecranon apophysis. This is where an MRI scan can come in uh, very handy in making a diagnosis of an olecranon stress fracture early on. He rested it and he ended up doing better and did not require internal fixation. He returned to play about six months after that MRI scan. 
he uh, injured it again and this is a little different pattern of um, fracture where it's not as far distal and he ended up uh, doing okay without any intervention and miraculously didn't have any problems. This is his uh, follow-up. We backed him down from throwing and he ended up healing that displaced fracture. You would think it could need to be excised. Uh, however, he had less and less problems. The upper right-hand x-ray is his lateral view. From the previous view, the uh, fracture is trying to heal and uh, he ended up doing okay with non-operative management. The question would be with smaller fragment, could you excise that fragment or would you fix it? This could probably be excised with care being taken to not do anything to the triceps, just take out that ununited piece. But fortunately he was uh, asymptomatic and did stop pitching because he wanted to do other activities. You may not have seen it, but it has seen you. There are athletes who have conditions that are uh, of concern. Just wanted to show you one case of a soccer athlete, not a throwing sport, but he came in with a complaint of a mass uh, in his left shoulder, axillary area. It had been there for a couple of years, no real injury. His mother dragged him in. He had normal stability of his shoulder, mildly tender, firm axillary mass. Um, Nothing uh, where he'd done any travel, no history of infection or other problems, otherwise healthy uh, soccer athlete. And this is one where examine the patient, listen to the uh, mother, listen to the child, see to see, try to see if they're upset, concerned about things. So he ended up having a synovial cell sarcoma. This is his uh, MRI scan. You can see that it's a very large mass. It was palpable. Make sure you have the baseball athlete take their shirt off, examine their scapula, their neck, opposite hip, but especially their shoulder. If it's a shoulder problem, if it's an elbow problem, do the same and examine their elbow and their shoulder and their scapula and their opposite hip. Here's the coronal view. Here's his axial view showing a large mass uh, anteriorly. Shoulder itself looks normal. This was a synovial cell sarcoma. He underwent limb salvage, sarcoma section, and chemotherapy and did, did well. Make the diagnosis early. Young children do get bad things. You want to make sure you don't miss a uh, problem like this. Examine the uh, shoulder. And if you do feel a mass, definitely do further workup. The mother didn't want us to do an MRI scan, but we insisted. They had a family member who was a pediatric rheumatologist who also insisted. So I think we saved this um, child's limb, if not his life. So in conclusion, we see the 13-year-old big picture syndrome. Skeletally and mentally immature, growing fast, poor pitching mechanics, opposite hip is weak, and he gets upper extremity overuse injuries. We need to protect our young athletes. We as healthcare providers should reduce the rate of rotator cuff tears, UCL tears, and young pitchers. And we can do this by making diagnoses early. Remember, the young pitchers don't become the older pitchers or go on to pitching in the pros. Utility players playing other positions is much healthier for shoulders and elbows, particularly during growth phase. Make the diagnosis. Little Leaguer's shoulder is a Salter 1, the proximal humerus. Little Leaguer's elbow is a medial epicondyle fracture as described by Adams in 1964. Don't just say it's pain, make the diagnosis. Is it a bony problem, as these are? Is it a rotator cuff problem? Is it an ulnar collateral ligament problem that's occurring in younger and younger individuals? Give the family and injured athletes a game plan for the injury and time to return. Tell them how long it's going to take them. Make it like an injury game. Can't be too fun to be on the sideline, but make sure you keep them off the diamond 
and not uh, doing too much stress on their elbow or shoulder as it heals. Prevention is key. The pitchers are at high risk. No speed gun, less showcases. Do training other than baseball, cross training. And just remember, little league pitchers do not become big league pitchers. You can use this uh, to uh, pitch prevention to the coaches and the parents and maybe even the pitchers. Use the STOP programs, sports trauma and overuse prevention, endorsed by the American Orthopedic of Sports Medicine Society. These are the, their websites. And just remember the unique aspects with young athletes. They don't feel pain. Their goal, goal is to please the parents, peers, coaches, and they must be protected.